Hey Defenders, this is Doug Burks with Security Onion Solutions. I started Security Onion in 2008 to provide a free and open source platform to help you peel back the layers of your enterprise and make your adversaries cry. Today, Security Onion has been downloaded over 1 million times and is being used by security teams around the world for threat hunting, enterprise security monitoring, and log management. If you're a blue teamer, make sure you hit that like button and make it turn blue. As you may know, we've been working on the next generation version of Security Onion for the last few years. We had codenamed it Hybrid Hunter, but recently we dropped the codename and we released Security Onion 2.0 Release Candidate 1. You can see that blog post here and you can read through that blog post for lots more information about this release. Uh, it's got lots of new features, it's got lots of new improvements. But the one thing that I want to focus on in this video is that we've brought back SO import PCAP. This is a feature that we've had in the traditional Security Onion platform for quite some time, and we've brought it back for 2.0. And the idea of SO import PCAP is that you could take a PCAP file, and traditionally you might run TCP replay to replay that PCAP file to a sniffing interface. But the problem is that then becomes new traffic. It's got new timestamps on it. And really what we'd like to be able to do is rather than replay the PCAP, we'd like to import the PCAP. Meaning that we want to preserve those original timestamps. So we brought back SO import PCAP for Security Onion 2.0 and that's what we're going to take a look at in this video. So if I want to import a PCAP, I first need to find a PCAP that I want to import. Now, a really great resource for this is a website called malwaretrafficanalysis.net. This is run by Brad Duncan, and he does an amazing job of frequently posting PCAPs of modern malware and ransomware and, and other interesting attack scenarios. So if you're not already checking this site on a, a, a regular basis, I highly recommend you check it out, malwaretrafficanalysis.net. And again, shout out to Brad Duncan for all the hard work that he puts into that site. So I'm looking at this particular entry that he's posted for July the 10th of 2020, and this is for TrickBot. And uh, there is a PCAP file here that you'll see is 3.6 megabytes. I've already downloaded this PCAP file, and uh, once you've downloaded it, you can then unzip it. Then you've got a PCAP file that's ready to be imported with SO import PCAP. I've already done that in this terminal window here. So I've already set up a virtual machine with Security Onion 2.0 Release Candidate 1. I've run through setup choosing evaluation mode. I have verified that all the services are up and running. And so I then can run SO import PCAP and give it the file name that I want it to import. So SO import PCAP takes that PCAP file, it runs it through Suricata, it runs it through Zeek, and then at the end, it gives you a hyperlink that you can highlight, copy, and then take over to your browser window. And that takes you to our new hunt interface, which gives you a really nice overview of all the data that was generated when we imported that PCAP file. As you remember, we ran that PCAP file through Suricata. We see some Suricata alerts at the bottom here. We ran that PCAP file through Zeek, and we see lots and lots of Zeek data here. And so this is a nice high-level overview of all the different data types that were generated by importing that PCAP. And if you look at the bottom of this Hunt web interface and you look at the individual logs and their timestamps, you'll notice that their timestamps show July the 10th. So we have actually imported this PCAP. We've preserved the original timestamps as opposed to replaying the PCAP, which would not preserve those original timestamps, but instead generate brand new timestamps. So now let's take a look at 
some of the data that we get out of this. Uh, we did notice that we had some Suricata alerts, so we could drill into those here, but we actually have another query here, which will give us a, a nice overview of just those Suricata network-based IDS alerts. So if I click on this NIDS alerts query, I get all of my network alerts and I'm grouping by rule name. And so that gives me a nice overview of the different rules that then generated alerts based on the traffic that was seen in that imported PCAP file. And so just by looking at the alerts themselves, we can start to piece together what actually happened in this particular TrickBot incident. Uh, and so you can see from Brad's webpage that this kind of started off with an Excel spreadsheet uh, and then things transpired from there. But let's take a look at what Suricata saw from a network perspective. And so if I were to look down here at the very bottom, this is going to show all of those alerts kind of one by one individually. And we're sorting by the timestamp field, so you can kind of see that everything starts on July the 10th at 2132, and it goes through 2145. But keep in mind that these are just the alerts. There may be other traffic that didn't generate alerts, and that might be where we start to look at our Zeek logs. But for now, let's get a high-level overview of what actually happened by looking at those IDS alerts. So the first thing that I might want to do is, is take my first alert here and maybe drill into it by clicking the down arrow. So that's going to show me all of the fields within that particular log. And so this is going to be in the emerging threats rule set in the info category, we have a dotted quad host DLL request. Now what does all that mean? Well, dotted quad host means that Instead of somebody going out to a website with a fully qualified domain name like www.google.com, they actually went out to a bare IP address. Now, that's somewhat suspicious, although there could be plenty of legitimate uses for connecting to bare IP addresses. But when we see that that happens and the user also requests a DLL, uh, a Windows dynamic link library, that's something that is seen quite often in these kinds of malware incidents where we're requesting a DLL, which is a specific type of Windows executable from a bare IP address out on the internet. So that's definitely interesting. Uh, and if we wanted to then see some details for that DLL file itself, we might want to pivot to full packet capture. So to do that, I'm gonna click this arrow here, and that's gonna spawn a new browser tab, which is gonna take me to our PCAP page, and it's gonna go and request that PCAP. It's gonna figure out exactly which TCP stream we wanted, and then render that TCP stream as an ASCII transcript. So here we can see the HTTP GET request for update.dll. And if we look at the host header, sure enough, it was not for a fully qualified domain name. Instead, it was for a bare IP address, which certainly seems like something which is less likely to be legitimate, more likely to be suspicious. As we continue into the traffic that's returned by the web server itself, and that's highlighted in red here, we see the file header and we see MZ, which is what we expect for a Windows DLL, which is a specific type of Windows EXE. And this program cannot be run in DOS mode. That's again, kind of expected for a DLL file. And so we absolutely see evidence that this was a true positive, that this was a user downloading a DLL from a dotted quad host out on the internet. And if we wanted to, we could download this as a PCAP and we could open it up in Wireshark or Network Miner. We could extract that file. We could do reverse engineering on it, whatever we wanted to do. But that's just our first IDS alert. 
And so if we start looking through kind of the rest of this list to kind of get a feel for what else is going on here, we'll notice just by looking at the port numbers, this one was 49723 as the source port. And we see some others here that have 49723 as the destination port. That's all the same TCP stream. It's just that the IDS alerts were written to look for uh, either a client traffic or server traffic, depending on how the rule was written. So all of these are going to be for the same TCP stream. We could look at the next stream that we have, which is 49727. We might drill into that. And we might see that this is, uh, again, in the emerging threats rule set. In the CNC or command and control category, this is for Fiodo Tracker Reported Command and Control Server Group 11. And so where the first alert we saw was for downloading an EXE, now we get the sense that the user has actually executed that EXE, that machine is checking in to the command and control server. And so we might then want to pivot to that full packet capture. And there we can see what appears to be encrypted traffic. This appears to be an SSL certificate, but a, a forged SSL certificate with clearly generic information, the kind of generic information that you would see in SSL certificates in malware incidents like this. We can also look at the port number and recognize that that's 449. Uh, which we normally expect to see SSL on port 443, but instead this is 449. So that's another kind of suspicious thing that's happening there. We have some more connections to port 449. Then we have a connection to port 447. So let's take a look at that one. Again, we see this appears to be SSL or TLS traffic. Uh, we, we see what appears to be an SSL certificate, but again, kind of a generic forged SSL certificate doesn't appear to be legitimate. It shows example.com as the site name there. So clearly generic, probably up to no good. As we continue on through these alerts, we get into uh, a TCP stream that's connecting to port 8082. So now if we drill into that one, we see that, again, this is for command and control traffic. And so now let's pivot to our full packet capture and let's see what we can see. This is where things really get interesting because now we see that there's an HTTP post. That means we're essentially uploading information to this command and control server. And again, we're going to a dotted quad host, a bare IP address out on the internet. We're going there on a non-standard port, 8082. And we're now uploading information about this victim PC itself. Here we see what appears to be a username and perhaps a password. Uh, we see Chrome passwords there. If we were to go back and look at some of the other connections, uh, we saw 49745 is what we were just looking at. We could look at 49746. And again, when we pivot to full packet capture, we see this information that's being exfiltrated about the victim PC itself. In this case, a process list. What's actually running on that box? We're telling the adversary more about the victim system. Here's system info coming from the Windows operating system itself. Net config workstation to include host name, username, software version. This gives all kinds of information. Uh, if the computer were joined to a domain, this could give the attacker more information that he might use to pillage the village, to perform some lateral movement and move across the enterprise and find other machines. Let's take a look at another stream here. Again, exfiltrating information, we see bill info, we see card info. Moving on, we might take a look at this stream. And again, we see OpenVPN passwords and configs. Think about all of that sensitive information that would be on a typical user's machine, which if it were then exfiltrated to an adversary, 
might be of use to them. We could pivot here and see OpenSSH private keys. And again, uh, at the end here, we see some connections to port 80. We might pivot to full packet capture there and see some other interesting downloads. Uh, in this case, we're seeing another Windows EXE download, but in this case, if you look at the GET request, we're actually requesting a PNG file, and we're actually getting a Windows EXE in response to that. And that's totally not expected on legitimate sites. That's totally not expected on legitimate downloads. And so that's something else that we could look for. You know, whenever we're working cases like this, and, and especially when we're looking at network-based IDS alerts coming from Suricata, we should be thinking in the back of our minds, if we didn't have these alerts to tip us off, how might we be able to detect this kind of behavior without the alerts themselves? And so in this case, well, there's really a couple of things, right? Because there's kind of a mismatch between what we requested and what we actually received. There's the fact that the host headers for a bare IP address. There's also the fact that if you look at the user agent string, it's for win HTTP loader 1.0. And so uh, what we might then do is kind of using that thought of how would we hunt for this activity assuming that we might have some more sophisticated adversaries that might be able to evade our IDS signatures, how might we hunt for this kind of activity using our Z-clogs uh, and looking for anomalies that way? So using that train of thought, let's kind of change our strategy here. And we've already kind of reviewed our IDS alerts, but let's kind of forget about that. Let's focus on our Zeek logs. And so maybe we might go to Zeek HTTP with exe downloads, right? And there we see, even if we never had the alerts in the first place, we would see that here's a user downloading from IP addresses on the internet, and those downloads are for Windows exes. So that's one way to find this kind of activity. Another thing that we could look at is HTTP grouped by user agent. This is always a, a fun query to run in enterprises. Look at those user agent strings on your network and you'll see legitimate user agent strings bubble up to the top and you'll see more suspicious user agents down near the bottom. And that's exactly what we see at the bottom of this list. There's that win HTTP loader 1.0. Some other things that we might do are look at HTTP grouped by destination port. So if I click on that, notice that most of my traffic is going to be on port 80, but I do see some traffic on port 8082. And so just be thinking about those kinds of strategies as you're doing your daily incident response, as you're reviewing your network-based IDS alerts, think about how you might be able to find that kind of activity if those NIDS alerts didn't fire in the first place and formulate those kind of hunting strategies, looking for those anomalies on your network. And keep in mind that we have all of this data at our fingertips in Security Onion. You've got not only the network-based IDS alerts, but you've got the Zeek logs and you've got full packet capture. And if you deploy endpoint agents, then we can collect endpoint telemetry as well. And that gives you additional visibility and you can correlate all those logs together. You can pivot from one data type to another very quickly and easily here in the hunt interface. And we covered that in a previous video using this community ID field where you can actually correlate from Suricata alerts to Zeek logs to Sysmon logs coming from a Windows endpoint and vice versa. And so that's extremely powerful when it comes to really painting a complete picture of what the adversary actually did in your environment. So again, this has been just a brief review of SOM port PCAP. Uh, it's now back in Security Onion 2.0 Release Candidate 1. We'd love for you to try out Security Onion 2.0 Release Candidate 1. Let us know what you think. Uh, give us your feedback. 
we'd love to hear from you and we'll see what we can do to incorporate that feedback in future release candidates. We do want to say thank you for tuning in to this YouTube video and if you are interested in things like training or professional services or our hardware appliances, please reach out to us at securityonionsolutions.com. We've got contact information there and we'd love to talk to you and figure out how we can help you to peel back the layers of your enterprise and make your adversaries cry.